aşkım. <gülüyor> Doşeler start. Karın. Tamam. Okey. Galip. Nice. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second session of the symposium. We have two uh, speakers uh, in the symposium. Sandrine Berges and Maya Mandalinci. We will start with Sandrine, uh, but before we start, just let me remind you a couple of things. Uh, each speaker will talk for about half an hour and we will take the questions uh, after each uh, speech. So you can write your questions in the chat box. Uh, so Sandrine's <clears throat> talk, the title of her talk is Writing About Women in the History of Political Thought, Do's and Don'ts. Before she begins, I would like to introduce uh, her to you briefly. Sanjin Berges is an associate professor of philosophy in Bilkent University. Her primary areas of interest are history of social and political philosophy and feminist philosophy. She's the author and editor of many publications on Mary Wilson Scraps political thought, feminist virtue ethics, and ancient and medieval political philosophy. In addition, she is the co-founder of the Turkish European Network for the Study of Women uh, Philosophy and of CIVIP-TR, Society for Women in Philosophy in Turkey. And she is also an active member of Project Box and the New Narratives Project International Groups. So in her talk, uh, Berges will illustrate some common errors committed while writing about women political philosophers via examples from well-known texts in the history of political philosophy. And she will explain what to do when writing about women philosophers. Okay, Sandrine. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my PowerPoint presentation with you. Okay. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for having me to, to talk about this. This is um, something I've been thinking quite a lot about in um, the past, past years. Um, one reason why I have been thinking about it is because I realized at some point in my career, not very long ago, that I knew nothing about the women philosophers of history. When I did my undergraduate studies, even my graduate studies, I just didn't come across any of them. They weren't part of my curriculum. I couldn't find them in bookshops. And, uh, and then I discovered Mary Wollstonecraft through teaching. And then from then on, I started working on women philosophers. So in recent years, maybe in the last 15 years, thanks to the effort of uh, philosophers throughout the world, including uh, in particular, Sarah Hutton, who is going to be talking uh, here tonight, there's, it's become a lot more common to talk about women when we do the history of philosophy, whether we write about it or whether we teach them. So there's a lot more of it. And part of the reason is because the texts have been made more accessible. Um, we know a bit more about their lives and their works. We know their names. Everyone's heard of Mary Wollstonecraft in philosophy now, I think, I hope. And their contributions to development of philosophical arguments is a lot better understood than it used to be. But this doesn't mean by, at all that we've become fluent in writing or talking about women in the history of philosophy. And what I wanna do here is talk a little bit about my experience in reading, writing and teaching about women in the history in particular of political philosophy, which is what I specialize on. All right, so I'm gonna do a what to do and what not to do thing. And I'm gonna start with what not to do because it's a lot easier. And in order to do that, I'm gonna look at texts by very famous historians of political thought. I'm gonna look at uh, Jonathan Israel and I'm going to look at Max Gallo, both of whom are household names. Uh, I mean, Max Gallo in France anyway. And I'm also look, going to look at earlier historical records. And I'm gonna do that in order to illustrate the mistakes that we're likely to make and that we should learn to avoid when we're writing about women in the history of in particular political philosophy. The first thing I'm gonna say is, well, don't ignore women, all right? Uh, they've been around for a long time, women philosophers. There's no point pretending that they didn't exist or that they didn't have an impact. Also, this looks, this is a bit more surprising perhaps, but don't steal from them. If a woman made a point that was significant enough to be included in, in your account, then make sure you attribute it to her. 
try not to talk about women's feminine writing styles or their emotional character uh, and don't insult them or you know by turning them into sex objects don't put them all together as if they were just one person right if you care enough to include women philosophers in your writing then include them as the individuals they were who made individual contributions not as a group whose only common point is their sex and, and don't just say that they were feminists when they clearly also wrote about other things. So women contributed to philosophy in many ways and not just in promoting their own cause as women. All of that was clearly important. So let's, let's start with the first, don't then. Um, here I'm looking first at Max Gallo, his history of the French Revolution in three volumes. The first volume gives an account of uh, the beginning of the French Revolution going all the way to the king's trial and death. So one, um, one political philosopher who was really quite important in discussion of the king's trial was Olympe de Gouche. She actually offered to defend the king. She published several texts arguing that uh, against Robespierre and against several others that it was just a really wrong idea to put him to death because you were killing a man, not a king. If you killed the man, you ended up um, keeping the title alive and this would eventually harm the Republic. So there's, there's quite a lot of interesting arguments there and it's nowhere mentioned in Max Gallo. In fact, her name just isn't there. So next I looked at Jonathan Israel's um, revolutionary ideas. And this is, this is a great book in many ways. Um, but it gives a list of 167 names at the end of the book, which she calls cast of main characters, and only eight of them are women. So that's his history of the French Revolution. Now, one, one notable omission, something that I found a little bit odd, was that he doesn't list Louise Keralio Robert in, in this uh, cast of main character. She was a journalist, she was a historian, and she was the founder of. Um, a journal that was really quite important during the revolution called Le Mercure National, which previously had been called the Journal de l'État du Citoyen. And he doesn't list her, but he lists her husband, Pierre Francois, who basically joined her on the editorial team of the journal after they married. He also had a political role to play because he was a man, but not a major role, not as major as uh, founding a journal and, and writing for it would have been at the time. Then I mentioned don't steal from them, and that, that may strike you as you know, a bit of a face palm moment. And here we've got Olam de Gouge with her face in her hand. Um, and then here I'm thinking of Max Gallo, who actually cites one of Manon Roland's letters. So Madame Roland was another um, French philosopher of the revolution that had been doing work on. And in one letter to a friend Bancal in 1792, she, she wrote this thing, she says, my friend Danton leads all, Robespierre is his puppet, and Marat holds his torch and dagger. It says quite a nice little, little sentence. And Gallo quotes it, but then he attributes it to a rumor instead of a very specific letter by Manon Roland written to a friend. So that, that's something that does happen and that we should obviously avoid as well. Now, the main thing that historians tend to do when they write about women philosophers is, is to turn to what, what it is that, that means that there are women to them, that even though they did contribute to, you know, to, to authorship during a particular period, to the development of a particular idea, they were still after all women in an important, in an important way. So here again, I've got an example from um, Jonathan Israel, who talks, when he talks about Olam de Gouge, tends to focus on her emotions. So when he describes her, he uses adjectives such as angry, fiery, and disgusted. Well, you can bet that he doesn't use similar adjectives when he talks about the men. Um, he goes a little bit further than that, but he's not just talking about her emotional attributes. He also draws on the fact that she was a woman, um, the rather odd assumption that she was a prostitute, or has it puts it a high class courtesan, which means basically an expensive prostitute. Now, why, why, why would he write this in, in a book on, on history? Why, why would he make that assumption? Well, this is an assumption that he drew from um, some 18th century gossip, in particular, 
the memoirs of the actor Fleury, who is a personal, professional, and political enemy of Gouge and wrote all sorts of uh, crazy and, and mean things about him. Um, and there's basically no other evidence that she was a prostitute and plenty of evidence that she wasn't. We know where her money came from. It came from her lover who wanted to settle money on her, not because she was a prostitute, but because she didn't want to marry him for principled reasons and he still wanted to support her and she accepted. Um, but that, that's something they can say. when you're writing about women in the history of philosophy is don't use gossip as historical evidence except perhaps with the exception of Doug in his last years because it's the only source we have for ancient philosophers and it's also a bit of a gossip but for writers like Madame de Gouge we've got plenty of sources which are much more reputable than um, the actor's memoir. I've got a couple more examples of how historians may sometimes treat women when they write about them. One example I got from a talk given by Evelyn Groot on Madame de Stael. Uh, Evelyn Groot is in Rotterdam. And it's a quote that she found in a review of Stael's book on Rousseau's works. Um, and the review says, it's an emphasis on temperamental inclination rather than a ripened criticism. A continuation of his study would show how in her mature and original work, Madame de Stel gradually thought out to definite literary and philosophical tenets whose ideas of Rousseau to which she was so strongly attracted. So, so here what, was, you know, what seems to stand out about Stel's work is that she's really in love with Rousseau and she's very passionate about it, but not quite capable of philosophical argument. And we find the same thing in um, 1927, text by a French historian Jean Martin, who's writing about Sophie de Grouchy. And he said about her that she had a serious character, a mind that flourished on philosophical meditations, Republican readings, and a passion for Rousseau's works had inflamed her head. So here we're talking about, again, somebody who's not quite got her whole uh, mental capacities because she's so passionate, and again, about Rousseau. Right? Um, he goes on to, to talk about very briefly about her philosophical work and he said that you know she tried to be so serious and so genuine and it was very boring. And so he's completely dismissive later on about what she actually did write. Okay, another common mistake that can easily be avoided by treating women philosophers as individuals rather than just as a token or a cluster of women is, is not to bunch them all together. Um, here I'm going to refer to um, a 1907 text by a young man who, who did a doctoral thesis in Paris. Um, actually, in Lyon, he did a doctoral thesis, and he was a, a medical student, and he decided to write his thesis on women's psychology and how women's psychology could be affected by, um, by big political movements. And, and he tells us right at the beginning that he was eventually, he was originally going to write about all the women of the French Revolution, but then he found he only had time to write about Olympe de Gouges. So he draws his conclusion about Gouges at the end of a, a biography that relies again mostly on gossip. He says, Olympe de Gouges suffered from a delirium with systematizing tendency, which has been described by some authors as paranoid delirium, paranoia reformatoria. She was predisposed to this and the revolution working on these prepared grounds found it easy to divert her from a normal mentality. So she was already unsettled, he says, and the revolution tipped her over. And of course, then because the, the work was meant to be about all women, he just adds at the end, well, we can say of, a numerous, of numerous women who were active in the revolution and played a sanguinary role that they were unbalanced. Right, so again, he's uh, just making a sweeping comment about all women. Jonathan Israel um, refers to women as little clusters. Right, so sometimes their names appear to be added where they don't belong. So for instance, we talk about Sophie Grouchy when he mentions a list of people who came out of prison after the terror. But Sophie Grouchy never actually went to prison. 
why she, she was not arrested. Um, and, and then he also talks about her as part of the Moulin's entourage. You know, he says that, you know, some of his friends, including Sophie Gouchy, agreed with what he said when he said it. And they'd the two had never met and were really quite um, different in terms of the views they had. So that's really odd. And you really get the impression that the name just was added. Let's just talk about Sophie Gouchy here. Let's just add her name here. But there's, there's no, there's nothing to back it up. Right, it's, it's again, it's, it's something that's completely unhistorical. There's no evidence for it and there's plenty of evidence to the contrary. So here I've just done a few screenshots of um, women clusters in, in Israel's book on the revolution. And you can see from what's um, involved that I did the search for Olam de Gouge and then found all these little clusters here. Um, so it's, it's quite often that uh, she's referred to along with Manon Roland with Tapan Dalders. And here we've got Sophie Salon, so that's Sophie de Grouchy. Um, again, Sophie, Sophie Condorcet, here yeah, that's also Sophie de Grouchy, so she changes names as well throughout the book. Um, and she's, um, she's supposed to be an outstanding woman of the French Revolution, as was Hollande de Gouge. And here, we're talking about the first great feminist, Sophie de Condorcet, Hollande de Gouge, et Pam, et cetera. And so, so you see, it just kind of, the names kind of come together and occasionally you get uh, English women as well. So there's Helen Mary Wynn. Sorry, I was muted for a second. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah. We can, we can hear you now, Sandy. Okay, okay, great. Um, so one thing that about the, the passage here, let me go back to the passage where... You are muted again. Okay, I, yes, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I think someone is muting me. Is it okay now? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm unmuted, but it just keeps switching. Uh, hi, uh, can, I, can I interpret? Uh, sorry, uh, there, there will be, uh, there was uh, someone who, who is joining our meeting and I was trying to admit him, but uh, by mistake, I admitted you, sorry. sorry. Okay, <laughs> all right, fine. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. explained. Sorry. All right, so let, let, let's look then. Um, they talk about the, the here, in this, no, oh, not this one. The great feminist, the first great feminist, Sophie de Condorcet, Alain de Gouges, et Pam Dalders, et cetera. Now, Sophie Gouchy, also Sophie Condorcet, Sophie Condorcet or just Sophie in Israel, um, was not a leading exponent of women's rights. This is how she's referred to in his book as well. It's not even clear that she was at all interested in the question of women's rights. She never wrote anything about it. In, in her one published text, there's a, a few things about women, not about women's rights as such. Now we know her husband, Condorcet, was very interested in that, but we have no evidence whatsoever that she was. So it's a little bit odd to refer to her as a leading exponent of women's rights. Now, when, when um, Israel talks about Rouge as a leading exponent of women's rights, that's absolutely fine. She was. She, not only did she write the Declaration of the Rights of Women, but she wrote a lot of other texts in which she talked about women. But she also wrote a lot of political texts in which she didn't talk about women. In which she talked about, um, well, when she talks about slavery, she talks about men and women slaves, obviously. And that's a form of intersectionalism, I guess. And so that, that's great. And we can still call her a feminist when she's doing that. But when she's writing about the meaning of republicanism or when she's writing about poverty, when she's writing about um, whether the king should be killed or not, it's not clear that she's just a feminist. She's a, a fully fledged political thinker who's also a feminist. And then we lose that when we just refer to these women as, as feminist thinkers. So what's given that these are the number of things that we shouldn't do, what should we do? Um, so here I'm gonna go through this list again. I'm not gonna tell you what the list is because we're gonna go through the things one by one. And I'm going to use here examples of um, the work I've done and uh, the things I've struggled with when I 
try to learn how to write about women in the history of philosophy. So the first thing I'm going to say is that even though we shouldn't just say they're feminists, we should make an effort to call them feminists. Even if they were writing in the, say, the 14th century, we should call them feminists under certain uh, conditions. Now, why would, why would we not want to do that? Well, some people argue that feminism wasn't coined till the 19th century, so it's completely anachronistic to call women before that feminists or to you know, talk about what they were writing as feminism. And the second thing is that the, the, we, their struggles are very different from the struggles we have. And, and we have trouble understanding it within the context of feminism. So it's not particularly helpful to frame it in that context. And here I've got an illustration of um, Christine de Pizan joining the slot walks um, 1411 instead of 2011 to show what I mean by anachronism. Now, I, don't I do think that these are objections worth considering, but they can be answered. Um, and, and I think it's really quite important to refer to these women as feminists whenever we can. So if we don't refer to them as feminists, then if we say that you know, there was no such thing as feminism before the 19th century when the word was invented, we're failing to recognize the impact that women of the past and their struggles have had on our present condition. And here I'm going to cite Karen Offen who says that what we're doing is we're allowing the obliteration of an extraordinary struggle, one of continuing importance to women and men today. So it's really important not to erase this, but to realize that women didn't just start caring about their rights in the 19th century. It came, you know, they were struggling against um, male supremacy a long time before that. So how do we frame their feminism, given that it's so very different in many respects from ours, well, a suggestion from uh, Ackerman and Stuhlman is to offer a three-point definition and, and then to talk about women as belonging to the feminism of a particular period. So the three points is first the criticism of misogyny and male supremacy. So you find that as early as Christine de Pizan, possibly even earlier. The conviction that women's condition is not an immutable part of nature, so that it's possible actually to, to educate men and women or to change policies and then the social and cultural infrastructure so that, um, so that equality is achieved. And also a sense of group gender identity. So when you get women talking about women as a group, then that answers that point. But another point to make is that we're a lot less uh, worried about anachronism when we talk about men. Right? I've got a quote here from Mary Garrett's excellent book on Artemisia Gentileschi and feminism in early modern Europe. And she says, it's true that early modern pro-female and anti-misogynist writers were not called feminist in their time. But to repeat an analogy I've used before, the work of Galileo and Newton was not called science in their day. It was natural philosophy. Today, they're regarded as foundational figures in the history of science, that is, scientists. Like science, feminism existed before we knew what to call it. And as with science, we must see the larger picture. If we do not recognize feminism as a continuum that has evolved over time, from the 14th century to the present, we risk separating women from our history and minimizing feminism's significance in history writ large. So it's, again, she's, she's making that point that it's extremely important that we should think of these women as feminists, even if the word doesn't quite fit. But, so you might, you might object here that it's really important as well to regard Galileo and Newton as not scientists, but natural philosophers. And that if you don't do that, then, and then you miss out on some of the things they did, some of the dialogues they had between science and, and, um, and, and, and metaphysics, physics and metaphysics in particular. And that's important, but that wouldn't mean that you wouldn't exclude them out of a history of science course for, you know, schools, you know, primary schools, for instance. Right? You would not say, okay, we can't talk about Newton and Galileo because, you know, they weren't really scientists if you are teaching the history of science to a bunch of kids. Or even at university, if you teach a course on history and philosophy of science, you will include them. It makes perfect sense. 
So I think a course on feminism should stop either in the 14th century, which is the most obvious start, or even earlier. I mean, there are people claiming that you can find feminist writings in ancient philosophy and certainly in earlier medieval philosophy. All right, so another problem with writing about women philosophers and a problem about how they're often portrayed, sometimes self-portrayed, is that they're isolated or they only communicate with male philosophers. So it's a kind of the myth of the lone female philosopher. It's like, here I am surrounded by men and I'm struggling to make my voice heard as a woman because women haven't done philosophy before. It's kind of like the Simone de Beauvoir syndrome. I like to call it. And it is something that is very easy to fall into. Um, I, I remember that as an undergraduate student surrounded by mostly male, uh, sorry, as a graduate student surrounded by mostly male graduate students, I thought I was a pioneer, right? Because I knew nothing about my history, basically. I knew nothing about the history of philosophy and the women in it. But it's very easy because of the context you're in to think of yourself as you know, one of very few women. Um, and, and sometimes, sometimes that is how women thought of themselves. Sometimes they were actually part of a circle of women and it's important to uncover that as well. So one extremely good example of how this can be done is a project that's being run at the new school in New York by Gina Luria Walker uh, and both Sarah Hutton and, and myself are part of it. Um, and this is a project of women's biographies called the New Historia, which seeks to highlight connections between all the women who shaped our thought, science and culture by creating a database of cross references. So I had um, some, some experience with the line of Mary Wollstonecraft. So basically you create a lifeline and then you connect it to lifelines of all the other women that, that came their way. And so if you follow the line of um, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, for instance, the author of Frankenstein and also a philosopher in her own right, you can tell that she was connected obviously to her mother, Mary Shelley, uh, sorry, Mary Wollstonecraft, but also her mother's friend, Manon Roland, whose biography she wrote. So Mary Wollstonecraft met Manon Roland and Mary Shelley wrote Man Manon Roland's biography. Uh, and then, they were also all connected to Scottish American Republican thinker Francis Wright, um, who kind of went to America to try and, and uh, abolish slavery and emancipate women, um, and to several of the 19th century American philosophers who were part of that tradition. So if you look, if you scratch a little bit below the surface, you see that there was in fact quite a big network of influence amongst women philosophers of the past. They weren't lone wolves, um, they, they were very well connected and, and they cared about what each other wrote and thought. Now, sometimes there are very good reasons why uh, women philosophers don't talk about other women philosophers and that's got nothing to do with um, that's got nothing to do with what they thought of each other. Sometimes they were really truly isolated. It was difficult for them to get uh, their hands on, on books because the books hadn't been published. They were only circulated as manuscripts and they were circulated mostly to men. And, and in some cases, there were actually reasons why you were aware of a woman philosopher in the past but wouldn't want to write about her. So here I've got the example of Christine de Pizan who in her City of Lady talks about many past women, real or fictional, uh, in, in all areas, but she has nothing to say about uh, Eloise of Argenté, who was, uh, she was already then extremely famous, extremely well-known, had published work that was philosophical and that Pizan could easily have referred to. But the City of Ladies is supposed to be a, a metaphorical city which is a place for good Christian women to flourish away from uh, men's, um, away from, 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 from men's influence, from men's notious influence. So for instance, she talks about Aristotle's writings about women and she says, how can we flourish when all the men around us think that we're basically bad? 
So the problem with Eloise, of course, is that although she was a Catholic nun, so in principle, a good Catholic woman, a good Christian woman, she also defended sex outside marriage in writing and in her life. And that just would have defeated the point that Pizan was trying to make if she'd included her in the City of Ladies. Another thing that we need to do when we're talking about women philosophers is we need to be very flexible about genre. So um, here you've got a picture of um, Madame de Scudery writing her novel, clearly, which was deeply philosophical. Uh, Olympe de Gouges, Margaret Cavendish, Beaufort plays, as well as many other things. Sophie Grouchy and Eloise wrote philosophical letters. Catherine Macaulay wrote a history and a bunch of letters, also a constitution. And Wollstonecraft wrote two novels, two treatises, educational works, a history and a travel book. Right. So you're thinking, well, if we're reading women, we need sometimes to look beyond the simple philosophical treatise. But that's not something that ought to be much of a problem for us because we're quite used to that. Plato and Nim wrote dialogues. Seneca wrote letters. Rousseau wrote an epistolary novel, an autobiography, and a book on education. Now, does this stop us from referring to them as philosophers? Well, no, absolutely. So why, why should it stop us from referring to women as philosophers, it shouldn't. And then so we need to go beyond, beyond that hangout we have about genre when it comes to women. Another thing we need to do is be a bit more flexible about what counts as political. Now, in the 17th and 18th century, when republicanism was uh, being hashed out and then put into practice, um, some writers thought that republicanism was just about politics that was done in, in the polis, in the sense of government. But there were a lot of women writers who wrote about politics being done from the home, and in particular about the home as a place where citizens were being shaped and nurtured. So it's really quite important to understand that even at that time, politics was not necessarily just stuff that was being done in um, in, in the, the assembly, it was also being done in the home. And so those who lived in the home were in a very good place to think about it. All right, so just wanting to conclude here, I wanna say we're getting a lot better at this, right? We are, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't carry on debating the methodology of how to write about women in the history of philosophy. The books I quoted from are both very recent books by very influential writers. Um, well, Max Gallo died recently, so he's not going to write anymore. But Jonathan Israel is, right? In fact, I'm going to talk by him in two days' time. So I, I think these things need to be pointed out because otherwise the mistakes will be made over and over again. And, and I definitely don't want to read ever again about Olympe de Gouges' career as a prostitute or, or see any woman's emotional reactions discussed instead of their philosophical work. Okay. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Uh, now, if we can actually, yes, okay. Sandrine, thank you very much. I mean, of course, uh, hearing all this is annoying, but at the same time, it, it's good. You're muted. Sorry, I'm <laughs> now. I'm muted. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, and I was just saying that, of course, hearing all this is very annoying, but at the same time, it's good that now we are talking about this. And at least there are some books published uh, and there are kind of corrections towards this misrepresentation of women. So it's really nice to hear all this. Um, so we can have the questions now. Uh, you can ask your questions uh, via the chat box. I mean, you can just write it down there if you have any questions. In the meantime, uh, could you just remind me, so Jonathan Israel, uh, when did he publish? So far, book? This book is 2014. Um, it's, I think, I'm not sure if this is most recent, but it's, it's quite, quite recent. Um, quite recent. Yes, 2014. 2014. Yes. Yeah, well. It's... <laughs> and and it's, so his previous books, I've got a few 
references, I think, to Mary Wollstonecraft, but not not much at all. Mm. Um, it's, it's hardly anything. So this is, and so what I did basically is I, I got the book and then I looked in the index for all references to to women and cataloged women, and, and then and then started finding the mistakes. Mm -hmm. And there were more mistakes than, than accurate points, so that was quite quite scary. I mean, I asked this because I must have missed it uh, during your presentation. I, I didn't think that it was such a recent book. Mm -hmm. Of course, probably it was written in your presentation, but yeah. I mean, yes, well, I mean, amazing. Yes. I'm happy to take questions later if people find it easier to... Uh, <laughs> no, we have, have actually. Okay. We have a question uh, from Özgür Soysal. Uh, well, he raised the question in Turkish, so I'm just going to read it out okay. in Turkish because it will be translated anyway. Okay. Won't it? Yes. Okay, so here is the question. Özgürleşme mücadelesi açısından... In terms of the emancipation struggle. E, feminist tarih yazımının önemi konusunu biraz açabilir misiniz? Could you elaborate on the importance of the feminist historiography? Mesela, For example, e, sizin Türkçe kanalınıza geçmeniz evet. gerekiyor. Türkçe konuştuğunuz zaman yoksa beni duyarsınız. Ha, For example, when we yeah, to carry the history of feminism to before modernity, what kind of historiographical problems can it pose or can it provide us with some opportunities? Can this be something like that? This is the question. Okay, thank you. Um, so you're, you're looking at um, writings that can be described as being part of history of feminism before early modern period, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to go really, really far back and uh, something that I've been reading about recently, the Pythagorean women. All right, so we're talking here about uh, women who may or may not have existed. We, don't, we know nothing about them beyond a few references to them or a few texts signed with women's names um, that are roughly part of the Neo-Pythagorean period, but it is very unclear, it's very difficult to date them accurately or even to decide where they were from. And then for a long time, these texts were just dismissed um, by historians of ancient philosophy as being fakes. So these have, you know, have, have very little interest because they are clearly fake. They were produced by people who knew uh, the Pythagorean tradition and used women's names. And there's nothing we can learn from them apart from the fact that there was a you know, big commerce in, in fake Pythagorean texts at the time. But more recently, um, women philosophers in particular have started to look into this text and why they, they still can't prove that these were written by women and certainly not by the women who claim to have written them. So for instance, there's one signed, there's two signed Felixione, who's Felixione was uh, Plato's mother. It's very unlikely that Plato's mom wrote this text, but it's not entirely unlikely that another woman wrote them, right? And then so from reading this text, we learned that it's at least conceivable, it was at least conceivable to ancient um, philosophers that women should write texts and we learned that it was at least conceivable to the general public at this time that women, that women should write philosophy. And, and we also learned about the kind of philosophy that they expected women to write. And I think that's, that's really quite interesting, even if we can prove that the texts were written by women, it still gives us some insight in the development of thinking about women's intellectual capacities and social role as early as um, I think it's second century BC, it starts this tradition. So I think we can always we can always find something by looking at women philosophers in the past. 
I, um, similarly, I don't think that there's very much to be found from the point of view of feminism in reading Eloise of Argenté. Um, but there is some stuff, so for instance, there's her resistance to marriage, um, her resistance to religious life even. But I think from the philosophical perspective, you can actually find a lot of, you, you, can, you can find something in her writing that you don't find in any other uh, moral philosopher of that period, apart from uh, John of Salisbury. That is there's some understanding of actual understanding of Aristotelian ethics. And I think that's important for feminism because what it does is that it reinserts women into the development of moral philosophy. And it, it tells us that we can do it. So there's, there's two things you can look at. You can try and understand the intellectual um, position and development of women earlier. And you can understand also how they've contributed to our discipline. So I think there's to these two things. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question from Soykal Yakın. Um, it's a bit longish, but I will read it. I will turn to Turkish again. Um, it will okay. be in Turkish. Professor Berges, thank you very much for your valuable speech. Thinking of the history of philosophy, the women are dismissed a lot, and you had discussed on this. The approach which is dismissing women has an effect on feminism and on the uh, historiography of philosophy. Galileo and Newton, what Galileo and Newton was doing had not been called science in their time, and this analogy was very striking. Now I think we are approaching to, to the question. Women philosophers have done various studies related to feminism beginning from the 14th century, but this wasn't seen as philosophy. Do you think that uh, the fact that this was not seen as a philosophy, the works of the women was, uh, were not seen as philosophy, uh, has a similar gap or is a similar gap in the historiography of philosophy? I did my best to understand, but I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, no, no, I, I followed the, the written text as well. That, I mean, I'm, I think. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, and so there's, there's two ways I could understand this. And I think one way isn't it. So these women from the 14th century onwards did see themselves as philosophers. And I think insofar as they were um, read by their contemporaries, they were also read as philosophers. Right? So they, they talk about themselves as philosophers and others talk about them as philosophers as well. But when we started looking back at them, and then that's something that's, I'm going to take the example of Mary Wollstonecraft here. Um, when I first started working on Wollstonecraft at, uh, in, in 2007, something like that, 2005 maybe, so not that long ago, I was teaching, preparing a course on Wollstonecraft here at Bill Kent, and and I just couldn't find any philosophical text on her, apart from uh, Virginia Sapiro's excellent book. There was hardly anything. Right? There were a lot of books about Wollstonecraft, but they were all um, part of um, women's studies, gender studies, English literature, history, but not philosophy. But that has changed a lot. But even 10 years ago, when um, I think I went to a bookshop in London and a bookshop in Oxford to see if my book on Wollstonecraft was on their shelves. So they, you know, they were nice bookshops. I wanted to see my book. It was there, but not in the philosophy section. Right? It was in the gender study section and in both bookshops. And another bookshop in, in Oxford, I, I asked you, don't you have any books by Wollstonecraft? And they said, oh, try biography and travel writing. I thought, what? Uh, and then, and of course, yes, because they had uh, a copy of her letters from Sweden in the travel writing section, but they didn't have any of her philosophy. Whereas, you know, in the philosophy section, there was um, quite a few books about her husband, Godwin. So, yes, I mean, this is something that's changing only quite slowly, actually. But in the case of Wollstonecraft, there's a lot of books and a lot of articles written about her. 
um, in philosophy by philosophers. And there's a lot of philosophy journals now that will have special issues on women in the history of philosophy. If, if you look at the British Journal for the History of Philosophy, for instance, it has got, it's got quite a few papers now about women philosophers. Things are really changing. I think I hope I've answered your question. I hope I didn't misunderstand it. Uh, thank you very much. We have another question. This might be our last question, and then we can move on to our second uh, speaker. And if we have enough time at the very end, we may also take some questions about Sadrin's paper. So again, this is a longish one, but I'm just going to uh, shorten it a bit. Um, so Kardelen Bozkurt uh, asked this question. Uh, I'm switching to Turkish now. Um, so basically, Kardelen is, pardon, Kardelen uh, şöyle söylüyor. Kardelen says, many women authors had to hide their identity. This was normal because the male authors were respected more than female authors. But despite this, they tried to produce something, and this means that they are a part of movement. But despite that, they do not consider themselves to be feminists. If we still call them feminists, will this be a kind of disrespect to their memories? Or should we consider that they have different um, uh, desires and uh, tendencies? And can we accept them? Can we consider them to be feminists? So question is basically, if they don't call themselves feminists. If we call them feminists, would it be a disrespect to their memory? Or should we call them feminists? Okay, that, that's a great question. Um, now, it really depends what, what, which women we're talking about. I think women who took uh, men's name that I know about were writing in the late 19th century. So I am thinking about uh, uh, George Eliot and uh, George Sand, the two Georges and then the, the Bronte sisters as well. Um, and so there, there, I think I would need to check my dates, but I think possibly these women were writing just before the word feminist was coined. Right? So they wouldn't have called themselves feminist because the word didn't exist. And, and Christine de Pizan wouldn't have called herself feminist again because the word didn't exist. So I don't think we're disrespecting anyone by giving them a name that they didn't take because it didn't exist. But there's a really, um, there's a really nice argument in, um, in Epistemic Injustice, the book, um, about a particular kind of, by, by Miranda Africa, a particular kind of injustice that happens when you don't have the words that, um, that you need to describe your condition. And so you go on being oppressed. And Miranda Fricke uses the example of sexual harassment. And then what women did before, there was a, a name for the concept of sexual harassment. They just left their jobs or got sacked and they didn't know quite why. They just felt really uncomfortable about it. And then eventually they got together and came up with a name and said, yeah, we were sexually harassed. And that's why we're feeling bad. It's not just us being weird. It's they did something bad to us, and that's what it's called. Now, so I think the fact that these women writing in the past before um, the, the term feminism was coined were, in a sense, suffering from that injustice. And when we call them feminists now, when we say that they're part of the feminist um, uh, of the feminist tradition, then we're just, you know. A, going back on an injustice. We're, being, we're doing the right thing. Right? Now then, there are probably some women writing in the early 20th century uh, who did not want to call, I mean, there are, I know there are some women writing in the 20th century. We even wrote about um, women's political condition and would not call themselves feminists, right? And in fact, they would reject that label very strongly. And then, and then of course, I don't think we should impose it on them or, or if we do, if we say, you know, what I think, you know, that she was mistaken, I think she was a feminist, then we need to do that quite carefully, of course. 
right? But just as if you wouldn't tell somebody to their face, you know, you know, somebody who is telling you, no, I'm not a feminist. Nonsense, you're a feminist. You'd have to be careful about how you did that. But sometimes we want to do that, right? If um, if you come across somebody who tells you, oh, I'm not a feminist because I am not a lesbian and I shave my legs and I don't hate men. And then that person tells you, yeah, but I do think that women should have the same rights as men. The way you are a feminist, dear, right? You, you will say that to them. So somebody who's uh, dead and gone, you know, you, you're not going to uh, cause them much harm by telling them that they were wrong about how they described themselves. But I guess that you still need to be respectful about how you do it. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. Well, thank you, Sadrin. Uh, <laughs> well, I just want to add or just support what you said. Well, after all, the fact that the concept is not there doesn't mean that the phenomenon is not there either. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I agree with you. Okay, well, we, we've got quite a few more questions, but I have to stop here, I'm afraid. Uh, otherwise, we won't have time uh, at the end uh, for our second speaker's question uh, period. So, um, so so now we are moving on to our second uh, speaker's presentation, Maya Mandalinji. The title of her paper is Historical Aspects of the Relationship Between Philosophy and Death. Uh, and let me introduce her to you. Um, she is currently a part-time lecturer in Bosch and Bakhtashir Universities. Her master's thesis is on the notion of anxiety in Heidegger and Freud, and her doctoral dissertation examines the relationship between Philosophy and Death, with a, with a focus on Hegel's and Heidegger's thought. She has also translated MacTaggart's studies in Hegelian cosmology into Turkish. In her lecture, she will be tracing the transformation of the philosophical meaning of death through a comparison of Plato's Phaedo and Heidegger's philosophy. Okay, Maya, all so, yours. Teşekkür ederim. <laughs> Sağ olun. Ben şimdi bir Türkçe kendimi de alayım. Thank you very much. I will be making my presentation in Turkish. And you can listen to the translation if you want to listen to it in English. Hi. First of all, my speech has a very grand title, you know. These are big issues. I will do my best to cover as much as possible. Let's see what will I be able to do. Let me begin like this. Um, yesterday's conference was so good and conference is going very well. Professor Brett Davis said something yesterday. Yes, I wanted to start from where he left know thyself but and he was saying that knowing thyself was basically drawing upon our practices social and institutional identities and language for and foremost and all the historical process we cannot think them differently from the what i have said that's the point where uh, the issue why we have to learn history comes into play this is maybe still slightly a background to knowing thyself, knowing Thai history, but also we can speak about the constructiveness of this um, through Heidegger. I'm planning on coming here. I want to discuss this too. But in the beginning, I want to ask this question. Know thyself. In Latin, Noskete ipsum. On the, the Delphoi temple, it was written with golden letters. Noskete ipsum is the Latin translation. But in uh, Delphoi temple, what we have on Delphoi temple is important. Why is it important? What does uh, the uh, what do they tell uh, try to tell us? by writing no thyself on the temple. Of course, this is something related to prophecy. There are some thoughts which we are attributing to prophecy. And from there, I want to come to 
death. Knowing thyself means knowing your powers, what you can do and you can't do. Uh, the I use the word kudret in Turkish, which is power or potentiality. What can we be? Delphoi and prophecy discourse is embracing. It is actually a kind of hubris being against Hubris. Hubris is a kind of arrogance, and it is the biggest error of the tragic hero, Hamartia of the tragic hero. From this, we come to that point, to run against one's destiny, to challenge the destiny which is standing before you with all its weight. And what does this carry to us? Actually, all this issue is related to death. It's uh, opening from the similar points, I mean. So how are we to understand death? It's easily said that we should know ourselves and we should start from knowing death. But I want to advocate the following, for example, from a Hegelian point of view, we can say, actually, our approach to the issue, knowing the issue, whatever the concept is, actually trans uh, changes the concept itself, or does it change the concept itself? This is a question opened from uh, Hegel. We can put hermeneutic reading to here, uh, commenting, interpreting, how to read the past texts. These are all similar things. And actually, while subject looks at something, the object also changes. Why I tell this? Because why death opens so that we can go back to know ourselves. Of course, I am not thinking from an essentialist point of view. There is an I and there is an absolute understanding of death. Of course, we are not at that point. Still, it is very valuable and important to follow this change historically. And I think there is a great thing to discuss here. It will not be very difficult. We see a, a transitory idea from the limitedness from the finite to infinite. And now I will be going with Heidegger. Of course, we cannot just um, pass on Heidegger. So I want to start from an interesting point. Feiden dialogue, where does it start from? Actually, with the following question. I want to read it completely. And I made a compilation from the different uh, translations. A right way of doing philosophy is actually a preparation for philosophy, uh, for that, sorry. I'm sure we have heard this. Uh, the practice of philosophy is a kind of preparation for that. When we undermine it, when we look at it, it's a kind of getting prepared for that, or even there are jokes among them. For example, Simia and Keves speaks. And he takes this um, interpretation. They are coming from Thebai and uh, even said uh, they said that Tebai people can die, no problem with them. Uh, they are doing a kind of joke. And Socrates is 
saying a kind of, yeah, uh, they have a nice rationality, but uh, actually they had drawn some wrong conclusions. So I understand what they mean. And then he reverses that pejorative meaning and he says that when we really understand it, what a philosopher should do is a kind of getting prepared for death. But this is very interesting in the dialogue. What is death? Death is, if it is a disconnection of the body from the spirit, it's better to have this, con this uh, connection as soon as uh, possible. This, the sooner the rupture, the better. Uh, first one, maybe it's about learning what that is in the real sense. And secondly, let's implement that in a practical way. Let's be like that people, because the joke was saying that the Bai people are already like that people. And maybe a third point, it can be open from a more moral point of view. And it brings us to myth. And myths, of course, to what extent they are philosophical, uh, to what extent you have to take it as a part of uh, Plato, should we read, uh, should we just gloss over them instead of dwelling upon them? I'm in the mythological part, but I will do my best to explain it to you. Let me go back to my subject topic. When we have recourse to myth, there is a third meaning coming in, which is to let alone being prepared for death, for guaranteeing death itself, let me use a non-philosophical concept, or let me use a philosophical saying, in order that this telos can realize itself, The individual should arrive at that with a philosophical way. Otherwise, that, so to say, does not kill. And this brings us to myth. This uh, spirit enters in a cycle. Um, we are speaking about uh, transmigration. And uh, the spirit cannot uh, get out of this cycle of getting born and dying. And when the individual is, limited or caught in this cycle, they cannot actually uh, get the death. The idea of death is actually sealing this because it's crowning here. You, I can guarantee dying only when I make philosophy and I want to die because earthly and uh, bodily life is uh, being kind of uh, humiliated um, or scorned. Uh, let me speak about this. We, most of us uh, already knows this. If we are, if we have read some basic philosophical text, we already know the following, but let me repeat them. Our spirits should actually turn its face from our body. We should turn our back to our body and turn towards spirit. And it is uh, getting unfolded through the dialogue. Where the spirit belongs to is a kind of a parallel reality. So there is a similarity here, because the concept of similarity is very important in ancient Greek. The likes will know likes. The like-minded will know like-minded. And within the scope of this uh, similarity is kind of important in terms of understanding the following. If we turn our back to the body, it will be actually allowing our spirit to realize itself. Of course, uh, Plato uh, refers to many um, main and earthly things. We are seeing many projects here. It's not only about eating, dining, and it's not about a kind of aesthetic life. 
we have we have a bigger war against spread uh, sorry against body what will ideas do of course they are the area to which the reality belongs and so they have to be able to watch the body so that we can turn our back to the bodily knowledge this is what socrates or plato said so now at this reason And of course, but the soul also, uh, it means that the soul is all infinite and it is found, and he lays the foundation for that logic. So the soul has, should exist before, and there are arguments like that uh, for this idea. And we already knew that, but we forgot them. So, then, and with all of them, he goes to dialogue to about to have the proof of that the soul is infinite, and he tries to find an evidence for it. And as I said, it was moral. And the toy, third point, as I said before, here we have again another uh, uh, to avoid evil. Another issue about to avoid evil, because in a finite soul, if it is evil, it is worse than having a soul which is infinite and it is evil more. And so within all this cycle, being always evil, think about that. And of course, here we can also see that the ancient Greece talking about evil, the thing which is out of philosophy. The philosophy is not the evil one, it is the good one. And the philosopher is the good one because when they divert to the ideas and ideas, it means that they are better. So, and here, again, the important thing here is to lay uh, among this cycle. If human is evil, or the thing created to destroy the, the disruption in the soul of them about being evil, then talk about with the second uh, cycle, if you combine it with the second idea, if when they cannot uh, complete this cycle in an ideal way, then they will always be imprisoned to a body because they are always like that. So that is something actually which is not happening actually again and again. We are only a part of a cycle and we cannot get rid of it. So it creates something like that. So as a parenthesis here, all the starting point of these ideas are actually very interesting. The Homer Homeric tradition, for example, it doesn't include something like that, but Pythagoras' tradition is something like that. And Plato has transferred this thought from Pythagoras, and it goes beyond Orpheus. Orpheus goes back to Dionysus or to Bacchus God. So which gods they are? They are actually about having being ex having been ecstasy in having an ecstasy in an experience so actually it is an experience going out of your body it when you say booze or alcohol you just try to match it with a body but the philosoph in philosophical context it is an experience about going out of your body or having an ecstasy or with other religious themes it is changed and then it makes them to go out of their body without alcohol. So here in the conservativeness of these gods, including the Orpheus tradition, the soul going out of the body is also feeding on these issues. So 
according to mythical internal tradition, it doesn't fit into ancient Greek tradition, actually. Plato takes one fight. The Sicily tradition, it is make, actually uh, resembles, or the Italy tradition, or even Plato, after he went to Italy, he changed uh, and he had a transformation. There are very different things, interesting things here in historical context, of course. But in all these discussions, in this Pythagoras tradition, the thing is, the soul are born repeatedly. The souls are born repeatedly. So our soul, which was divine, is fallen. We, the thing we are familiar with, the things, the ideas we are familiar with are now actually founded and laid their foundations in these ideas. Our souls was divine and it was for when then they are fallen. In Homeric tradition, it's not something like that. Heroes are related to to the divine one. But in Pythagoras tradition, it's something like that. So let's go back to the myths. So if we turn back to the myths to conclude, to Plato uh, one, uh, to close it actually, it is not so known or people are not interested it, interested with it. So I would like to talk about that in the fast way. So after Socrates, he brings us to the point that where the soul is eternal, but here there's a moral manoeuvre here, which is actually, it's not a preparation about being uh, res uh, closer to that, to ease, to facilitate the way to the that as a philosopher, about going out of this cycle we need it actually, they need it so to go out of this cycle, to break this cycle, and then myth starts. So, so when Socrates to is talking about myth, he says that the word is shaped in a different way. It is a different word design. The word is a round one, it is in a divine uh, uh, thing in the, in the divine order, and it is in a homogeneous order and within its uh, internal dynamics, it is hanged within this divine order. And there are gaps, there are holes in the world. And these holes are actually like pits. There are pressures, lava is going out of them, waters are going out of them, etc. And the cave allegory is here, actually. It, it is similar to this cave allegory. We do not live upon the surface of the world. We are actually living in the pits of the world. When we go out to the surface, imagine what we will see. It is very similar to the cave allegory here, actually. So here, the, the thing which is not disrupted, the ether, the uh, air, which makes it uh, pure is still there. So he compares it like that. If something underwater is disrupted because of water or the water makes it everything vague or colorless, he defines it like that. It is just like a sand pit, but it is, it exists like that. And our word, when compared to the other word, it is something like that. When compared to the surface of the word. So this surface is actually a point where ideas are living. So, he gives us a message that they are in a different context. Everything is perfect that human are there in the surface. They live longer than us. There are crystals. They are always uh, in living in a very colorful world. Human and animals living on the surface of the world are perfect. So going to this human and animal side, we actually, with that, we deserve to go with next to them. This is important because even there, still, Still, we are under the influence of the matter. Even if it isn't disrupted, we are still in the conservativeness of the body. And the person who will be free is the philosopher. Then it will move to the 
idea. So it goes to connect it. It connects it. Uh, actually, are they going to uh, to that cycle again or not? He compare. He gives examples about that. For example, if you are ambitious throughout your life, if you are addicted to bodily influences a lot, or you will be born again as a donkey in the world if after life. So. If you do some mysterious things, for example, or on fire things, you will be born as an animal, which is a very fierce one. But if you lived in a proper way, in a moral context, you will be born again. But in order to go up to the surface, it is the impression or the stories he gives the clues about that to go up to the surface it is a moral process you need you have to do it willingly and plato says that if you learned only with your practice maybe you can remind aristo aristotle uh, to your mind even plato there is again a maneuver that being moral, if you really internalized being a morally superior person, yes, you can be, but it, at the top, the one who, who are at the top level are the ones who got rid of their body. So, uh, so they, all these are preparations for the death. So it means eternal, actually. We see, if, and actually, we do not see as finite things. We see that that is red, something as something eternal. So, eternal and that are getting infinite, and that are closely connected to each other. They are doors opening to each other. But then Heidegger says that it is transformed into. You have to utter the idea of that. But before passing to the Heidegger, to Heidegger, at the end of the dialogue, actually, it is actually related with the that day, uh, the day Socrates died, actually, and his last words and conservatives. Nazire Kalaiji has translated. Uh, uh, he ha she has talked about it in long videos. You can maybe listen her. The last words of Socrates, she read it upon Foucault by referring to Foucault, and she agrees with him. And so I do not go on to answer. It is a very um, good topic, actually. In his last words, he was talking with Crito, and Crito asks him how we can bury you. And Socrates says that you didn't understand anything I have told you for three hours. Why do you ask about burying me? You can only bury me if, if my body, even if you catch me. If you catch me, you can bury me. Yeah, he said. But, and he said that there is a language uh, connotation here. In the language, why don't you know that, Kriton, our mistakes in the language actually reveals the mistakes in our souls, actually or the language in the mistakes we made in the language impacts our soul. So this is a language determinism topic, actually. How language is actually in all the cultural, if we influence language, but language is also influences us. The way we use inf uh, language also shapes our perspective. And so Socrates is giving a clue here. So I would like to define that, to express that to so. Okay. The, actually, I just want to talk about uh, Heidegger. I have 10 minutes, I think, yeah. Let's, I would like to pass to Heidegger. It is, of course, a very different language. It's a very different thing, but I just want to open it in terms of uh, to have uh, some con connections as uh, we have history in the center of this symposium. So I think that the point here, this Hegelian or know thyself issue, as I said, 
our perspective related with our perspective everything are transformed or altogether or renew each other in this issue in the historical perspective it is very organic we can say it's a reality we always experience it and always we see it of course but i just want to think that again finite when that is linked with being finite uh, and entered this philosophy as an issue to discuss again. That it comes to the question that how much that occupied a part in philosophy. So maybe in all the tradition about the eternal uh, thing we discussed about that, which part we can give to that in order to know ourselves. In order to know ourselves, where we will put that so that it will touch upon our truth or intersect with our truth, like Epicurus, for example. Maybe we can go to Epicurus for commenting on that. But what did he say, actually? If that exists, I'm not there. If uh, I am here, that do, do not exist. There are symmetrical arguments there. There are analytic traditions which are supporting that in terms of going to the essence of the topic. But the main issue here is the that do not touch us, actually. That doesn't touch us. Epicurus is not actually, it's to, Epicurus is talking about being finite, but it is still open that whether that touches us or not until we come to Heidegger. And then when we go to, when we talk about Heidegger now, here actually it comes in a way that Heidegger still now talk about that human, the foundation and meaning of human is actually a finite uh, time actually. So when we start with a huge definition, it shows us how much that can open us for discussion. As for Heidegger, it is, it is the case. So, actually knowing yourself in this, knowing your tradition, we say Dasein, for example, we can start with him, with them, Dasein, Dasein, actually. That sign actually means that the uh, thing which actually have an issue within its with its essence actually. So if we do not ask this question, of course we don't have time to open Heidegger uh, as a discussion a lot. But the main problem here is if we define it as it is something which thinks, it thinks about itself. If you talk about an existence, it, it questions it, it, its own existence. So thinking, uh, it's talking or thinking animals or human thinking or uh, in a Cartesian way, for example, thinking way. If I think I, uh, I exist, for, but it, it, is, it says in its tradition, but when it leaves the tradition. Why we define it as the, why we define the sign as is the existence with question its existence. He said that I do not ca call this person, this thing, this entity as a human. It, I call it as the sign of it. So this is thing. The thing it is we say. Actually, it shows actually everything. It sits. It puts everything to life itself. So when I'm not on a place where I think about something else in order to understand that, when I do not actually discuss an entity I look from outside, actually, it is an um, issue as a performance. I question it. It means that I live. It is but this is the thinking of the performance. Sorry, Maya, we have to close in a 
two minutes because we need questions. So, okay, I it's actually a hard topic. Maybe uh, maybe we can then talk about it in the questions too. But at this point, I have to talk fast. So that actually with about this questioning performance, not only a thinking performance, but it is actually a life performance. So the existence and that time and human, let's say, the actually in order to understand it, the only thing we understand it, it is the only horizon point about the temporality of this performance. We need it as a, to understand it to, as a temporality because we cannot close this uh, temporality, actually. The, that is closing this temporality. That is a horizon point which closes this temporality. But it is never a point which is the final, final point. But if we see that as a final point, if we turn it into an event or a moment, or if we mark it as, a, as an event in time, every moment we t see it like that, our, my connection and my relationship with that is founded in a wrong way. And so I cannot know myself. So knowing in order to know myself, it, this is the whole philosophy of Heidegger is knowing thyself, of course. So the movement of me as knowing myself, it's finite. I have to understand it in a real way. So in this real comprehension, I do not think I shouldn't think of that that something will happen to me one day. I will die in a plane, I will die in a crash, not on thinking about that in this context, but thinking about that, which actually belongs to me every moment. It's maybe a cliche, but Heidegger opens these cliches and uh, makes it something very different in a very different philosophy. Maybe we will talk about that one day, but let me close it here. Thank you so much. Maybe we will open it with some questions with Heidegger. Okay, the first question comes. Bahar Azab asks two questions. I would just ask the first, and if no questions will arise, I will uh, ask the second, of course. First, she asks, uh, and she extends his thanks, and he is ask she's asking for the first question. What is the influence of Indian uh, in the cycle toad? And are they are there any actually for cycle toad? Actually, you are talking about Plato, I think. Say, okay, and okay, but the influence of the Indian, and uh, of course, it's actually the ancient toads of Egypt. Actually, of course, they, they exist and influence the, the cycle toad, but. Um, we don't know the roots of it exactly. So there are lots of allusions, uh, festivities actually, allusion festivities and meetings. There are very secret toes shared. It is uh, mostly combined with Orpheus tradition. I think that possibly it has a huge impact, but not rather than Indian toad, the structure of Egypt actually influenced them. It is a closer geography, you know, by transferring or coming there, etc. So, of course, there are a lot of other influences, but they're not different, actually. This tradition actually needs to be understood and comprehended well, I think. Okay, uh, I can say that, yes. Okay, let's tell uh, how the second question of Bahar. If Plato was informed about the religious literature of today, what would he say about die before you die? <laughs> yeah, it is not so different, I can say. They, he see 
you will say a similar sentence in a metaphorical way, I can say. So the thing you do, the perspective you look from, uh, it's actually a think uh, thought platform. Of course, it has a morality issue here or a morality dimension. In ancient Greek, in Homer tradition, for example, no one, uh, it wasn't uh, understood the other word, the afterlife is not, uh, was not comprehended as a reward or punishment thing. But in Pythagoras uh, dimension, we must see a lot of reward and punishment. And still, if you talk with someone else, they can say something, you know, some mythical thoughts, they can utter you some mythical thoughts, something like that. Okay, I was thinking about when I when we talked about when we think of physio uh, dialogue in the state, for example, uh, when he was talking about Pythagoras tradition, Orpheus, and Dionysus, and if you think that it comes from all these roots, the uh, the war he opened against Homeros, actually Homer, actually is seen in the state in Plato's. Of course, there are other projects after he moved to Italy. We can see it in a more uh, in the clearest way. Actually, he explains it. Actually, I think I was thinking these the two dialogues in parallel to each other. Actually. All midterm dialogues of uh, Plato belongs to his Sicily travels, actually, in which we mostly read uh, in philosophy or teach to our students. It mostly belongs to his late uh, term um, days, actually. But before that, we see the Socrates mostly, uh, actually. Of course, it is discussed widely in the literature. But we must see the voice of Socrates in the early days. But when we uh, start to see him clearer way, it is of course his late days of his Sicily travels. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Özgür Soysal's question. Thank you so much for your question. Ancient philosophers, we know that, many ancient philosophers said that that is not bad for us. But today, it is not so convincing for us. We, the modern ones, are we not successful about coping with that? Or do we discuss the question or the problem in a very different way? Do we handle it in a very different way? Yes, it's a very different, uh, it's a very good question, actually. Yes, we handle it in a different way. Yes, I think so. But in addition to that, it is hard to answer that question, but maybe there will be some good points uh, I can hear. In Plato, for example, especially in Phaidon dialogue, we see that that is not something about extension or you are not uh, terminated. It is the if we see it like that, the fear grows bigger. What if our soul is evil? And what if we leave it by ourselves? And so we see this termination in the verse, so without not being, um, it is more fearful, actually. When we talk about Epicurus, Epicurus says everyone that it is actually it's good to actually to get um, a transformation. Epicurus says that when you terminate, are you afraid of gods? Are you afraid of being punished? Or are you afraid of getting the bodily punishment? You are all free of that. I got you free all of these fears, actually. If I am here, that that is not there. If I am here, and he's, when he says that the soul will not continue, if the soul continues, actually, it becomes the source of fear, actually. Today, yes, we also have in a more religious literature, we are 
uh, we, we got frightened from the, the hell, for example, but having that in this context, of course, changed our, shows that we changed our center. To whom I talk about that, they think they are also frightened about the, uh, the their beloved ones will feel sorry for them, or it also may be Levinas's thoughts, the that of the other, or it op it resembles to your that. It has to be my own that so that I can understand that, so that I can see it. What does it change? He says. There are lots of political. There are many political thoughts coming from uh, this. Uh, he's saying so because he is like that. There are many discussions here. But two things you have said is important. Is uh, the idea that finiteness, finiteness is different, uh, different for us? Is it because of this that we cannot come into terms with that because coming from finite to infinite is um, a very different tradition. Um, Islamic tradition, Christian tradition, medieval age. According to this, existence after that is not a kind of zeitgeist. It's being questioned, but maybe it's not just in the air. And about the death of the other, there is a different actual difference. My dad and the others that this creates a, a rupture, actually. Thank you very much. We have to conclude at latest at 5.40. I will take a very last question, maybe so that you can make a comment. And Temiskan says that Freud says that the objective of life is death. Can we think Heidegger from this perspective? If yes, what we can say about this? Again, a very nice question. Thanatos, mm, of course, it's a um, definition and being seeing the act, the impulse of that, impetus of death, asking for that. I think this is very different for Heidegger. Heidegger is against everyone because he has a so different position. Whatever you say, Heidegger will say something else. This is how it is. But let me open the door from this point. The similarity, I mean, to be fast. For Heidegger, this is also misunderstood. So that's why I want to say this. For Heidegger, there is a concept of preconditioning death as a probability that is there. It is closing my horizon, and I am walking towards it. And the life is that movement itself. I'm not discussing this, but also there is a movement of understanding. Yet this understanding is never asking for or uh, desiring that. But this is how Heidegger writes. He is using, the, for example, waiting, expecting death. But Heidegger is undermining them before this. It's not about, it's not a death of dying for me, because in, in this way, I will be nothingness. So I cannot speak about this realization. Heidegger plays with all this because from the Epicurean point of view, I will be perished. But this is not the act of perishing while approaching them. It's about understanding my finite being. The very moment where since I am closest, maybe potentially it's the very moment I am farthest from it. It doesn't make sense. And Heidegger is quite against to understand it like this. It's not like walking fastly towards that. He says it's about seeing that and coming back from this and from temporality. It has some elaborations. Thank you very much for this.
Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Sanjin. And if there are any questions, I would like to take them. Uh, we could not share all questions. There are many questions, uh, which is good because everyone has listened in a, such an engaged way. Uh, we can end it at the moment. Thank you very much for your kind participation. Thank you very much for your invitation. Everything is so good. I continue to follow the symposium. Thank you very much for all.